all of them board members are present. The San Marcos Unified School District Board of Education meeting is a business meeting of the board held in public. While we welcome and encourage public participation, the expected behavior is that this meeting will be conducted in an orderly fashion. Only the person recognized by the board president may speak. While that member of the public is speaking, members of the audience must not yell or speak out, regardless of whether you agree or disagree. While public comment is in progress, if you speak out, you are out of order and will be asked to leave the meeting. As adults participating in a public meeting, we need to model civility to our children and students. On behalf of the Board of Education, we thank you in advance for helping us conduct this meeting respectfully. The San Marcos Unified School District is an innovative and collaborative community providing an unparalleled educational experience through an engaging and supportive environment, all of our students are cha challenged, inspired, and poised to excel. The Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Stacy, seconded by Sarah to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 4.4, 4, report of action taken in closed session. We met in closed session to discuss matters pertaining to public employee employment, transfer, appointment, discipline, dismissal, release, and evaluation. By a motion of Carlos and a second by Sarah, the board approves the settlement agreement and release of certified, certified, sorry, certificate, thank you, certificated employee number 135672, effective June 30th, 2023, by a unanimous vote. 4.5 reports by student board representatives. Good evening, school board members and audience. I hope you all had a great holiday season and let's get into the latest at San Marcos High School. Right before finals, we hosted our annual Cocoa and Cram event, a time for our freshmen to get some tutoring and advice from our upperclassmen link crew members before taking their first final exams. They enjoyed some hot cocoa, decorated cookies, watched holiday movies, studied with their friends and mentors, and even got a visit from Santa. Thanks to our link crew leaders for supporting our underclassmen. Another way we celebrate our students' hard work before finals week is our fun before finals spirit week with dress up days and daily lunchtime activities. Our fan favorite spirit day was Teacher Thursday, where you dress up as your favorite teacher and then take them donut bobbing at lunch. Students had a great time dressing up and celebrating with their friends as we approached the final push to winter break. A handful of students attended our second session of Camp Lead at the beginning of December, continuing to hone in their leadership skills and find their passions by connecting with students from all over California. A few students were featured on CBS's Zevly Zone segment to discuss their experience, where students discuss overcoming challenges and finding inspiration from the leaders of Camp Lead. Thank you to SMHS students for representing San Marcos so, so well, and County Supervisor Jim Desmond, who helped make it possible for our students to attend. Our Knights of the Roundtable continue to visit schools throughout SMUSD, most recently stopping at Double Peak School on their Leadership and Healthy Choices Tour promoting healthy lifestyles for all SMUSD students and serving as strong role models for our young student population. They give presentations to students in groups and of course, hand out their signature trading cards. Thank you, Court, for your strong presence in the district. San Marcos also had the honor of hosting this year's CIF cheer competition in our own Knights Center with the Knights cheer team placing third overall in the county. Our incredible dance program hosted their annual fall show at the beginning of December, putting on three sold out performances where the talented groups shined on stage. 
a combination of the dance classes and the dance teams made for around 350 people in this performance. This year, the show was Cinderella themed and it was like usual, all the buzz on campus. They did an outstanding job. Our model United Nations team went to the Bishop School Conference where they performed incredibly well and two students, Xander Black and James Loweth earned awards for their committees. Senior Fiona Burns earned the $180,000 NROTC scholarship from the US Marine Corps for her outstanding work in the ROTC program. Congratulations, Fiona. It was a big month for our VAPA programs. Our choir program had two big performances with their winter concert and their San Marco City tree lighting event. And they also did some caroling around school. Our band program had their jazz concert and their winter concert where they performed incredibly well. And they also earned the educators grant by the Cal Coast Cares Foundation, which is gonna provide funding for outstanding programs such as our band program. For the final story, I have the monthly sports update. We're now in the winter sports season and our athletes are doing great. Girls basketball is nine and seven, boys basketball is nine and eight. Girls water polo is six and five. Girls wrestling is one zero. Boys wrestling is two and one. Boys soccer is four, six, one. And the girls soccer team is seven, five and two with a big game recently where they tied Jay Sarah, which is a nationally ranked team. So that was awesome. We're super excited for the rest of the season and league competition begins soon. So we're really proud of our student athletes. That's all for this month. Thank you and go Knights. Before you sit down. So you're with us here tonight, Abby, at our board meeting. You want to tell the board where you were last night and oh. a little bit about that experience. Yeah. So last night, I am also the San Diego County Office of Education District 4 student board member. So last night, I attended another school board meeting at the San Diego County Office of Education, which was super exciting. I got the opportunity to work with some county level leaders and learn a lot more about that local official position, which was super exciting. Thank you. Five point out communication session. If you wish to address the board, you may fill out a request form located at the alcove on the left of the double doors as you enter the boardroom. Please complete a white speaker form if the item you wish to speak about is on the agenda and a blue speaker form if the item you wish to speak about is not on the agenda. Please give it to Susie. In accordance with board policy 9323, public comments will be limited to 20 minutes per topic. Each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to speak, except for our union representatives who have a five minute limit. Members of the board are very limited in their response to statements or questions per the Brown Act. Unless an item has been placed on the published agenda, there shall be no action taken. The board may one, acknowledge receipt of the information, report and comment, two, refer to staff for further study, or three, refer to the matter in the next agenda. And, according, and a recording is made of all open sessions of the governing board. Again, on behalf of the Board of Education, we thank you in advance for helping us conduct this meeting respectfully. Susie, do we have any speakers? There are no requests to speak. Thank you. 6.0 presentations, San Alejo Middle School. Mary? Got everyone. Uh, good evening, President Chamberlain, uh, San Marcos uh, Unified School Board board members. Special welcome to Mr. Ramos. First meeting, congratulations. Um, and Superintendent Johnson, Executive Cabinet. My name is Barry Ziet. I'm proud principal of San Leo Middle School. With me, I have our hardworking and passionate assistant principals, Ms. Self, come on up. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Sestito, joined by our student leaders, Frank Yamador, ASB president, Savvy, our ASB vice president, um, Vivian McHenry, web leader. And um, tonight we're going to talk about San Leon Middle School. Okay. So our vision is exploration, discovery, growth through connections, complexity, 
collaboration and character. Our purpose is our kids. We believe their success comes from a vision that involves these key words of exploration, discovery, and growth. Expl exploration is a sixth grade experience where students are exploring a world they have never experienced, six periods, six teachers, other students they've never met. Discovery is their seventh grade experience, a time where they discover, hey, I'm good at music. I'm good at math. I'm good at writing. I'm good at art. And they discover the, this passion that can motivate their success and finally growth. Physically, mentally, eighth grade, a time where they grow into young adults, ready to take on the next stage of their journey, of their educational experience at high school. It is through connections, our relationships, complexity, challenging tasks in the classroom, collaboration, working together, and it's the character, the whole child, that will bring out the best version of themselves. We know our kids can achieve their potential by doing the best, and our mantra is to do your best and respect the nest. Uh, when we need to refocus or align our students back into what they want to achieve. Uh, respecting each other, respecting the learning, respecting adults, respecting the environment that they're in every day, and most of all, respecting themselves. This is what anchors us as a school and anchors our conversations, not only at school, but within the community itself. So who are the students at San Leo Middle School? We have 507 sixth graders, 490 uh, seventh graders, and 459 eighth graders. We are a large comprehensive middle school. We try to offer as much opportunities as we can for our students. Most of our students, um, the ethnicity is white, uh, followed by um, Hispanic, um, and then we have um, some other uh, ethnicities, 8% um, and 7% Asian um, and 1% African American. So predominantly a school uh, where 60% of our population um, is white. Our home languages, 88% um, of our school, um, English is their first language at home. So we know that really everything happens in the classroom and our focus is one that is really focused on our vision. Uh, we believe that collaborative conversations and accountable group work are the key for our students in order for them to be prepared beyond school, uh, beyond middle school. And really, this is about working together. We know that a lot of our industries and a lot of the future, it's about working with one another and working with each other. So the challenge we have is that 55% of what happens in the classroom is student to student interaction. And the work that they do in the classroom is productive, rigorous, challenging, and also uh, uses a high level of academic language and individual accountability. Equitable practice, everybody is in part of the learning process that all students, and when we say all, we mean all students are part of the learning, which means that our lessons are designed to include all students to work together collaboratively in order to get to um, their learning expectations and their learning goals. We use technology to build understanding and to build knowledge and we continually monitor student performance by uh, forming our PLCs, looking at data, looking at their progress and looking how we can continually work to improve our craft of teaching and learning for our students. So um, the vision's there, uh, the mantra's there, the instructional focus is these four key areas. So we really truly believe our students um, are provided the keys to success um, for not only life at middle school, but beyond. Okay. Um, here's some examples on how we do that. Um, as you can see, we have pictures of our teachers working through their um, staff meetings through a pro professional development. When we say we want to see, we would like to see our kids doing collaborative work in the classroom um, and working with each other, we also would like to see our teachers doing that as far as part of their professional growth. A lot of what we want to model and what we do, we want to see our teachers um, sort of feel it and know it and put themselves in the shoes of the students. So a lot of our PDs are focused for our teachers to work um, aligned to the instructional focus. And on the uh, on right or left, whichever way you're looking at it, you can see a, a picture of a classroom in a circle. That's a scientific circle. Students are working um, using a discourse to communicate. And the bottom there is a discussion map. And this is part of our equity focus where we are, we are, monitoring who's speaking, how many times someone is speaking and what they are saying. So we include all students in that process of a collaborative circle, as you can see. 
Okay, uh, next I want to pass it on to Mr. Stito, our system principal, who's going to talk about our multi-tier systems of support. Thank you. At SEMS, we use a multi-tiered system of supports. This is a systemic continuous improvement framework in which database problem solving and decision making provides each of our golden eagles with the tools that they need to be successful. At SEMS, we work as a team to support all students, social, emotional, academic, and behavioral growth. We examine data every six weeks to identify students that need more targeted supports and to monitor their progress moving forward. We work collaboratively to support students by holding student study team meetings. These meetings are conducted to develop a plan of action for individual student success and include a team of teachers, students, parents, school counselors, and administrators. Our coordination of services team meetings involve many staff members, including administrators, counselors, our social workers, school psychologists, attendance staff, and our health clerk, among others, working together to implement more interven intensive interventions for at-promise students. We are well-rounded in our data collection and look at everything from discipline to attendance to grades to citizenship to state test results, along with much more information to determine the areas of support needed. Pulling and examining data so frequently enables us to constantly use the most current information to best help our Golden Eagles soar. Beyond the regular curriculum, we also offer our students an academic curriculum, and we know that their success cannot only be um, cannot be done without a social emotional support as well. So um, we work very hard on having our students envision where they'll be after their three years at middle school. So we put together an academic plan with them. Um, we also teach them some of the success tools that they'll need to go beyond their years at middle school um, through our um, academic and, and uh, career curriculum as well. So beyond the regular um, you know, day-to-day -day work, we do a lot of work uh, to support their growth, not only um, academically, but obviously uh, emotionally and, and, and physically and mentally getting them ready for life beyond uh, middle school. Um, part of the example there for our social emotional second step is the curriculum that we're using. It's a wonderful curriculum in the sense that it's sort of a standalone curriculum now where our teachers have adopted it as part of the, the sort of the day-to-day the -day norm or the, the tools that they're going to use to support our students uh, because we really do care about their, their success, um, as I said, not only academically but socially, emotionally. Okay, next, this is the fun part, really is. This is about our kids, and um, to, to start, we want to talk about our ASB. We'll bring up Frankie Amador, our president. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Frankie Amador, president of ASB at San Alejo Middle School. So uh, today I want to talk about some of the things that we do in ASB and what I do as president. So first of all, this class is run by students and everyone plays a very important role in this class. And as president, it's my responsibility and job to run the class and direct the instructions for the day. Not only that, but outside of ASB, I like to be a friend for all. And the pictures that you are seeing now are all ASB events. On the left, we are distributing the student ID cards to all of our students. On the top right, we have our uh, eighth grade uh, dance, which was funded and ran by ASB. And on the bottom right, we have some ASB representatives attending a lunch meet led by the Rotary Club of San Marcos uh, after we attended the lead camp. Uh, ASB is such a good time for everyone and we're always busy, whether it's creating posters, speaking on SEMS TV, uh, or just spreading school spirit. Thank you so much. And this is our ASB vice president. Hi, I'm Savannah Smith and I'm the San Alejo vice president. We're excited to introduce, oh, sorry. We're excited to introduce clubs on our campus this year. There are a variety of clubs on campus to suit everyone's interests. Clubs help create a safe space where students can feel included and have fun. These clubs include art, baking, chess, drama, crochet, and many more. We hope kids feel like they belong at school. All clubs are created by kids, managed by kids, and for the kids. Clubs have been a huge success at SEMS this school year.
We are also thrilled to bring yet another exciting program called No Place for Hate. This is a program where our students pledge to make STEMS a hate-free campus. Our No Place for Hate committee will be teaching four lessons throughout the year to help promote a comfortable and inclusive environment. At the beginning of the year, we had our students sign a feather, pledging their commitment to keep our school hate free. Our, no, our committee then took over 1,500 signed feathers and designed an eagle mural that signifies the SEM students that are devoted to making our campus a safe place where learning and curiosity is encouraged. Hello, my name is Vivian McHenry and I'm a web representative. WEB, which stands for Where Everybody Belongs, is a program that was reinstated this year at SEMS as a way to connect the incoming sixth graders with eighth grade mentors. Before school started, there was a middle school orientation where every eighth grade leader had the job of building social connections with the sixth graders in their group. We also answered questions about SEMS um, and played fun games as a way to introduce people. Ultimately, our goal was to make sure the sixth graders were comfortable with transitioning into middle school. I definitely think that getting reassurance from someone who had been in their exact same situation helped lots of anxious students. Web helps the sixth graders, but also develops leadership in the eighth graders, which is an important trait for the future. Overall, I think Web is an amazing program for everyone involved, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Thank you for having me. And uh, lastly, we talk about our co-curricular enrichment opportunities we have for our students after school. Can you not see these wonderful students right here in a couple of years? <laughs> All right, I'm Mrs. Self, Assistant Principal. So I only have one picture up here tonight because I'd probably be here for another couple hours. With all our co-curricular -cur uh, learning opportunities, we have so many after school the last couple of years, so I wanted to share those as well as rigorous content and opportunity for deeper learning throughout the day at SEMS, we have also provided students with co-curricular enrichment classes. We offer tutoring courses in the academic areas of math, science, language arts, and social science for all our sixth through eighth grade students four days a week. We additionally offer emotional support courses, health courses, elective and sport courses, with options in visual and performing arts, technology, foreign language, robotics, esports, a run club, color guard, and field hockey, just to name a few. In two weeks, we start the second semester with 19 courses offered after school. It wouldn't be possible without the kickoff of the Extended Learning Opportunity Grant in 2021 school year, our amazing dedicated PTO for funding the current school year and bringing back stakeholders to plan and execute another successful extended learning opportunity in 22-23 school year. Fingers crossed. We also would like to thank our wonderful dedicated staff who have hosted additional courses after school to continue to promote skills for students to be successful in co-curricular areas with rigorous content, skill building, and growth mindset as their focus. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to what we do at San Leo Middle School. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I just wanna add both my kids have one of them is attending SEMS and one of them did already. And honestly, they both loved it so much. Their experiences have been great. And the clubs this year, my son loves them. So thank you. I get to pick them up an hour later, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. <laughs> Um, I just want to say, as a fellow ASB kid, I have a lot of respect for seeing you guys come up here and present. You're doing so much amazing stuff on your campus, and it makes me really excited for you guys to come to, hopefully, San Marcos, to um, continue to help grow our ASB program. You're going to make a really big difference in your future, so I'm really excited for you guys. So quick comment for the parents. Thank you so much for supporting your children. This is, that's awesome. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, 6.2, dual immersion program update by Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Campbell. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. It's never good to follow kids, but I am excited to bring you some updates um, with our dual language immersion program. The focus of tonight's presentation is how we will be transitioning from our elementary program into our middle school program. So just to begin, I wanted to give just a brief timeline of where our dual language immersion program started and where we are now. So in 2019, 2019-2020 uh, school year, the dual language program began um, at Twin Oaks Elementary School in both TK and kindergarten. Um, and we have rolled every year adding an additional grade. This year in 22-23, we begin, uh, um, we are in our third grade year. So our plan timeline moving forward, then in 23-24 is our fourth grade and 24-25, which leads us in two years, we will have students matriculating into um, our middle school program. Our middle school program will be housed at Woodland Park, um, and it will begin with sixth grade 25-26 and move on from there. So what does dual language look like at our middle school? Here's where we are moving into a more focused program, whereas Twin Oaks Elementary is a full school um, dual language immersion program. At our middle school, it will be a humanities program that's basically a strand that will be housed at Woodland Park. Um, the strand will be optional within a student's schedule. We are assuming and hoping that all students that are moving from uh, Twin Oaks Elementary will move into this strand. Um, and it will be an English language arts and history, social studies, humanities block. Um, they will take English language arts, will be taught in English, and their history social studies will be taught in Spanish. Um, our teachers of those two courses will work together as a pair and create a curriculum that um, complements um, both sides um, of the house. Additionally, in seventh and eighth grade, they will take a high school level Spanish language course in seventh and eighth grade. And at the end of their time at Woodland Park, they will receive a biliteracy pathway certificate um, for completing the middle school program. And that will lead further into the, the bilingual um, pathway in high school, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. So um, just giving you a little bit more detail into the program progression, here's what we are thinking it will look like. In sixth grade, they will have their um, DLI English Language Arts and DLI History Social Studies. And then they will have typical math, typical science, typical PE, which they must, must take, and they will have an elective period. I will say here, um, we are considering a sixth grade option um, that is part of the dual language pathway. However, we want to be careful in understanding that this is a transition year that they will be moving into sixth grade. Um, and it's a big transition. So we don't want to overwhelm them. So we're still having those conversations. In seventh and eighth grade, again, they will have English language arts and history social studies, but they will have an additional Spanish class. And the Spanish class that is offered both at seventh and eighth grade will be a high school level Spanish class. We are looking at either, they will have the option of Spanish one, Spanish for Spanish speakers one, or Spanish language arts. They will receive 10 credits of high school credits in their seventh grade year, 10 credits of high school Spanish in their eighth grade year. So they will meet their two year language requirement in middle school, which is crazy and fantastic. So is yes. this going to, so seventh and eighth grade, the Spanish classes for them to get their seal of biliteracy takes the place of their electives? It will take the place of an elective, yes. Okay. Uh, to the, so they, when they start high school, they'll start in Spanish two or three? They will likely start in Spanish three, or if they've taken Spanish for Spanish one, uh, Spanish for Spanish one and Spanish for Spanish speakers two, they will likely start in AP Spanish language. Okay. That was my question. So this is just a consideration. Yes. And we're several years away yes. for seventh and eighth grade. 
We have an amazing music program in our district. Tonight, we got to hear from ASB. Mm -hmm. I would hate for these students to miss out on that elective. You only get one elective in, mm -hmm. in middle school and seventh and eighth grade. So consideration would be perhaps like a zero period Spanish or an after school Spanish. I, I feel that mm -hmm. having history, social science for Spanish is an opportunity for them to immerse themselves yes. for that block. So I just, I'm, I'm glad there's an asterisk there, but just a consideration is there because that way we don't take away that Absolutely. experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to chime in as well. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to start developing a four to six year plan, graduation plan, mm -hmm. and only to get them thinking about what electives, because once they hit high school, that's when the college prep courses are for the A through G for university yes. consideration. So definitely a four to six year plan should be considered. Yes, definitely. I'll talk a little, actually, we can talk a little bit more about that, um, looking at beyond the middle school program. So in thinking about where they could possibly matriculate to um, moving from middle school into high school. So if they've taken Spanish two in eighth grade, possibilities are they could take Spanish three honors in ninth grade, 10th grade AP Spanish language, 11th grade, we are introducing a new translation and interpretation pathway. Um, you will actually hear about that later on tonight. Um, so they could possibly take a translation and interpretation one, translation and interpretation two in 12th grade, um, which would give them a translation interpretation certificate that they can use immediately. Um, in addition to the California seal of biliteracy that they would get on their high school diploma. So this is a career, if you are thinking about a career pathway, this is an easy career pathway for them to take. Um, if you are a, spe a speaker taking Spanish for Spanish speakers too, and you have left eighth grade, you can take ninth grade AP Spanish language, start that translation and finish that pathway in 11th grade, and then in 12th grade college courses, AP Spanish literature, a number of different options also open up. Obviously, we are several years away from um, this type of pathway, but this is a pathway that could exist with our current classes that we are offering. Um, we are actively pursuing what are some other things um, that we can offer as well in addition, um, but this is what we have currently. So it's an exciting thing um, to see a full pathway that can emerge if you are coming out of our Twin Oaks Elementary dual immersion program that could actually get you a CTE certificate, it gets you AP courses, it gets you credits of high school in middle school. So lots of positive things um, coming um, as we consider this transition from the elementary program into the middle school program. Is all of that required for students to get their seal of biliteracy? It is not. They actually could get their seal of biliteracy by finishing the eighth grade path. And then there is a there is a um there is a portion that is with CASP scores that they have to meet, but they will likely meet it. But as far as the dual language, as far as the world language is concerned, they will meet it in eighth grade. Okay. And so if they didn't do um, one of the, if they didn't take the Spanish, a Spanish course in seventh or eighth grade and took a different elective, for instance, mm -hmm. could they, could they then jump back into a track in high school and still complete their seal of biliteracy? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So they yes. have, they have multiple options to continue to get their seal of biliteracy. Yes. That we can plug in, in different areas. Definitely. Okay. They will not be tied to having take having to take that Spanish course in middle school, but it will be an option for them to take. Okay. One of the things I will say, one of the things that we have heard from the Twin Oaks Elementary community, um, something that is important to them is having that language opportunity in middle school. So we want to be sure we have that. Okay, so preparing where we are now. So as I've said, we are currently with our third graders. So there is a little work still to do for Twin Oaks Elementary. Um, there is a we need to do a language proficiency assessment process for fifth grade students, because one of the questions that we will have as they matriculate into um, middle school is what will be the level of their Spanish? And do they need a Spanish one? Or will they be um, will they be able to take a Spanish for Spanish speakers 
one class instead. They're a little bit different. So that will be one of the things that we need to look at as far as the assessment process is concerned. Um, currently, things that are already happening and in motion at Woodland Park, we have admin teachers and district office staff. We are making visits to current middle schools. They've gone to two middle schools already, are visiting others as well. Um, a big one is appropriate credentialing and staffing for middle school. And it is something that we have to do now and start thinking about now because we will need we will need staff that is um, bilingual and BCLAD certified. Um, trainers of teachers in the program, in the principles of dual language immersion, and in the creation of the um, humanities course and ongoing research and development to expand our language options and opportunities in the high school level. And with that, other questions, other discussion? So in December, we had the opportunity to visit. We were so impressed with the work they're doing there. It's so collaborative and hearing the students speak their second language was just amazing, even in third grade. So yes. I'm hoping that we'll, the board will get to have a presentation from Twin Oaks and, mm -hmm. and, and learn about the growing pains and also where they're going and just hear from the students and, and parents and staff. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know this is, I, I know that that articulating the full pathway has been a really, really big deal for the community yes. to just understand what what the the end of the road picture is for their mm -hmm. students. And so thanks for for doing that for them and for the, the, this presentation. And I, I love the fact that there are lots of options for the students to be able to. I, as a parent, have a specific idea of what I want for my student, but mm -hmm. she has totally different ideas. And <laughs> when the older they get, they change, like it just changes. And so I like the fact that, you know, they can change their mind and mm -hmm. still come back and complete it if they, you know, if yes. they want to do other things. So it thank is the you. options. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. 7.0 report by Superintendent Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. So the um, our last board meeting was right before winter break and we have only just returned. So not a lot to report out on tonight, I'll be brief. Um, but the big, really the big news uh, this past week was Richland. So Richland opened on Monday, the new campus opened up on Monday. Oh, I have a whole scroll there. Sorry, gotta scroll through these and get these up on the screen. Um, you're aware of all these all these uh, details about the about the school. I just want to say a couple things. Um, you know, moving moving from an old school site into a new school site is a big deal. It's not as, as easy as just packing up your boxes and moving over. There are a thousand of details, a thousand details that were up in the air for a long time. And I, I just want to say what an amazing uh, facility it is. What an amazing vibe on the campus right now. And I want to take a moment and just thank a, a number of people because they really, really, really worked hard, starting with Principal Julie Barbara and Assistant Principal Julie Morgan. These guys have been, I got an email, in fact, today from one of the staff members saying how how hard they're working and how much support they've given. Um, they, they've been planning for this move for months and months and months and months. While most of us were off on winter break, turning our alarms off and re relaxing, resting. They were on campus. Many of the teachers were on campus. Support staff was on campus. Last week when I was visiting, it was raining and they're still moving boxes in and smiles and everything else. Uh, the entire Richland staff has done a phenomenal job from the office to the teachers to everybody. Our facilities team has been phenomenal. Our m &O team, our technology, our IT teams. There was a there was a brief moment where the phones weren't ringing in the right places, and uh, they got on it. And before I could even ask how is it going, it was all, all fixed. Our CNS staff, the architect, the construction team, Balfour Beatty, everybody has been really phenomenal. When I was there on Monday, uh, opening day, and I toured all the, the entire uh, site, I went to all the classrooms, nothing but smiles. And, and as tired as people were, there's just a really great energy on the campus. And so I just wanted to, to pause and just say what an amazing um, what an amazing, uh, what an amazing new school and new facility for these kids, a new home for our kids. It's really, really awesome. Um, I just wanted to also highlight, oh yeah, really quickly that the, um, Julie and the team organized, uh, Monday, Monday was really like, a, like the first day of school again. I mean, kids were showing up and they didn't know where things were. I mean, they, I, I was walking around the campus, uh, as I said, and a kid came out of 
his classroom and he was going home early and I saw him walking down the hall with his back. He's talking to himself. Wait a minute. Was the exit? No, no, no. These stairs over here. I mean, these kids are still trying to figure out where to go, but uh, they, they opened the campus in the morning to all the parents and we had hundreds and hundreds. Julie actually estimated about a thousand parents on campus. Wow. You get to go and see, were you there? I was there. That's yeah. What she said. yeah. 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 Uh, and so they got to see it and it was really, really phenomenal. So um, I just want to thank the entire Richland community and also our neighbors. I don't know if our neighbors watch our board meetings or not, but I did put out a, uh, a communication to our neighbors just to thank them for all the dust. We still got some more to go. So now they're into phase two and they'll do the uh, the playgrounds on where the existing campus is. And I also want to say that our team has done a phenomenal job. The construction team is doing a phenomenal job. They're not just bulldozing the old campus. They're actually removing as many of the items as they can. They're being very environmentally uh, conscious and friendly. I, one of the days when I was there when in the rain, they were removing windows and I'm not sure what they're going to do with those windows, but they're going to reuse them. Um, so that I think that was, that was really encouraging as well. So congratulations to the Richland community on your new home. And they've been so patient. I know every time we visit, yeah. they were like, <clears throat> it was a construction zone and those kids and you know, those, yeah. that staff teachers, yeah. I mean, yeah, they deserve it. So. I should also say that the first day of school, you know, on our new campus, it's going to be what it is. I mean, it was, it was a little chaotic, um, particularly with parking. So we have, we have a brand new, I mean, the parking lot now is it's like Xanadu. I mean, it's compared to, <laughs> compared to the old one, right? The old one had however many spots in it. Now they got a huge new parking spot, but still it's a new pattern. It's a new, new, new traffic patterns and all for the families. And there was a little bit of a challenge there. And one of our neighbors emailed us and said, this is a little bit chaotic here. I want to commend Aaron and the team. They were on the phone that afternoon. The very next morning, we had sheriffs there. We had other people directing traffic and it all went away. That first, I shouldn't say it went away. It's getting better. And as people get uh, into the new swing of things and the new habits, it's all going to be. So, so that was my great. question with three pickup zones. Does that alleviate some of the pick, like yeah, chaos big time. Oh, that big time. happens at pickup? Big time. Yes. Okay, it's going to be great. It's going to be really, really good. So, so congratulations to Richland. Uh, and then I just want to give a little heads up for what's coming in February. So Aaron's going to talk a little bit more about the, the governor's uh, January budget proposal that just came out. And we'll have some more information on that uh, and the potential implications for our district uh, next month. I know the board is aware of the process and the cycle. So um, just as a reminder, the governor's January budget is really now kicking off a six month process, right? It's not gonna be finished until June. We'll know a lot more in May. There's gonna be a lot of back and forth from now between now and then. So we'll continue to monitor it. I did see a report that came out earlier this week uh, that read this way, I'll just read it. It said the economic and revenue conditions in California are particularly volatile right now. And everything from significant revenue gains to dipping into a recession are still possible over the next months and years, which is just really challenging. I think there's the way I look at it. If I kind of scale back, there are always ups and downs with our with our economy and with the with the funding in our schools. Uh, we're used to that. I think the pandemic is. I, I don't know if this is the right image, but it's like throwing a boulder into a pond. I mean, those ripples are still going. I mean, we we feel like we're kind of out of the pandemic, but I think the ripple effect is still there. It's still hard to predict what's going to happen. So we need to be we need to be conscious of that. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, so next next month, we'll also talk about our continued advocacy efforts on the board is, is, is going to be doing some advocacy in Washington, D.C. We'll continue to do some advocacy in Sacramento. One piece that I know I spoke a lot about last year, and I know the board is aware of this, but LCFF in California, there are three layers. I talk about that three layer layer cake, the base funding that all schools, all school districts get supplemental funding for your English learners, uh, low income students, foster students, right, which we also receive. And then that third layer which is concentration, uh, the concentration funds that we don't receive, that's 65% more money for all the kids in this category. Uh, I, we've talked about this a lot. Vista gets this money, Oceanside gets this money. We, and you get, you qualify for concentration grant, right? If you're if 55% of the students in your district are low-income English learner foster youth, right? Um, I have said for a long time, and I was ringing this bell all through last year, we're sitting at about 40% in our district. So four out of 10 students in our district fall into this category and we don't get a dime of concentration money for them. And that's not fair. There's no difference between the students uh, who are sitting in our, in our seats right here and the students who are four or five miles down the road in Vista, they get a lot of money for them that we don't get. That's not fair. And what I've been advocating, what I've been trying to get people's attention on is why don't, if the state still wants to allocate concentration money to school districts, why don't they do it like the federal government does, like they do Title I? and allocate it to individuals. I was very pleased, I was, it, there's a mixed bag here, but I was very pleased in the governor's bu January budget proposal, he is proposing that model. 
However, I'll say the comma, what the, the bar he has set is very high. So he has said that if a school has, his proposal is if a school serves 90% of students in those categories, then they would qualify. Okay, we don't have any schools that are that high. However, I have been speaking to lobbyists uh, just today, as a matter of fact, I see this as a window of opportunity for us to get in there and really advocate for bringing that, if we could just bring that bar from 90 down to, it may be a big ask, if we get it down to about 60 or 65, we'd have a five schools that would qualify for that money. If we can get it to 75, that would still, we still have a couple schools that would, that would, um, that would qualify for that money. So that's going to be a lot of our advocacy and my advocacy and the board's advocacy from here through May. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we can do something there. Uh, also in February, our, our updated annual um, district demographic study, we hope will come to the board. We hope it'll be ready in February. That's important to do as the board is aware. It's important to do every year as we're monitoring the demographics uh, shifts in our in our in our district, which are always shifting. Homes that are going up, who's who's which homes are selling? Are there families moving in? Are are there are their kids coming in? Are they not? Uh, and at what pace? So that we'll have some better um, answers on that hopefully next uh, next week or next month. Sorry. And then finally, just later on this spring, I know the board is aware of this, but I wanted to just by way of reminder, <clears throat> um, all school districts have hundreds and hundreds of board policies and we're no exception. Over time, those policies, if they're not kept up to date, they get, I, I prefer to, they just get barnacles on them like, like the underside of a ship does and you got to keep them updated. So it's been a little while since we've done this. So our team has been working for the number of months now. We've been working with CSBA and we will be bringing back to the board what we're calling a global adoption. So you're going to see a whole bunch of board policies that are all being updated all at once. And 99% of them are because the law has changed because we have policies that still reference old exams that we don't give anymore, those kinds of things, right? Um, so we'll bring all those up to speed and we'll get completely current this spring. And then from there going forward, we'll be able to bring board, uh, policies to the board every month or every quarter and keep them all up to speed. Uh, so I just want to let you know that that is coming. And I want to commend the staff. A lot of them are working over the break. Uh, Ed Services has got a whole stack. Business Services has got a whole stack. HR has got a whole stack. All of us have stacks of policies that we've been going through every single one individually to bring them up to speed. And we're working with CSB on that. So that is also coming later this spring. This, will there be a new system in place for those board policies to be held in one comprehensive? Yes. Where you can just type in a keyword and boom. Yes. It takes you there. Yes. That's called gamut. Uh, I was surprised when I got to the district that we're not on gamut. Uh, we, we were on gamut for a while. At some point it lapsed. Now we have a system. If anybody's ever tried to look for our board policies, it's, it's a little difficult. It's one big, long PDF uh, with all kinds of old stuff in there. So yes, we're going to get all that fixed up too. We'll be on the gamut system. It'll be very easy to find our board policies. Thank you. Thank you. 8.0 reports by Deputy Superintendent and Assistant Superintendent. I only have two slides. So, Exciting news, we have officially launched um, our mental health program. We did give you an update um, at a previous board meeting that it was coming and it is here. So we have had our student staff and family emails have gone out. Our social media has started. Website is up and going. Printed resources are out. Signage is around on our campuses and our ambassador shirts, pins and stickers are here. We are ready to face it together with our students um, and with our ambassadors. So we are very excited that the program has, start, has started. Um, we will continue to give updates um, about the success of the program. And we have put in, um, we are looking at what dates um, we are going to present to our city of San Marcos City Council. Um, I wanna say in the next couple of months, we'll be, um, we'll be presenting. So super exciting. And then the only other thing I want to talk about very briefly is a save the date. Um, new enrollment for students opens February 1st. And this really is for everyone out there. Um, new enrollees, TK through 12, we start February 1st. The marketing campaign will start here hot and heavy pretty soon, um, where we will be marketing both internally and externally um, to 
tell people about how great San Marcos Unified is um, and where they should be coming. Um, we'll have our TK eligibility expansion does continue this year. So we expand another two months. So students who turn five between September and April 2nd um, will be eligible for TK. Um, and then for our current students, we are doing, we are continuing with online residency verification. We did it for the first time. Um, for reals last, last year, um, and it was successful, we will continue that. Um, and so that is happening 6-5 through 6-30 in June. So a little bit different, but we really just want to save the date and let you know that enrollment is coming. And that's it. Um, I have a question about the Let's Face It Together campaign. So the student population, I feel, is kind of hard to reach sometimes and that they don't really read their emails and Google yes. Classroom notifications are kind of just swept past, that kind of thing. And we've all seen the banners and the flyers and stuff on campus, and we're really excited about that. But I think people just don't really know what the yes. Let's Face It Together campaign is. So how is that communication going to happen with the students? So that will continue with our, we just met with our principals today. So we talked to them a bit about that. We've talked to social workers as well as um, uh, school psychologists and counselors. Um, so we will be working directly with our student groups um, in order to get the word out. One of the things we actually did talk about um, with Ms. Frias uh, this week is working with our Clubs are the presidents of our clubs, like our BSUs, our um, Asian, Asian Pacific clubs, our ASBs. But in order to get to students in a smaller group as opposed to wide. So we want to kind of pick our ambassadors and have them approach their particular student groups. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a great question, Abigail. My question as a follow-up is bilingual Spanish support for our Hispanohablantes. It is all translated into Spanish as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, the governor released his January budget proposal on Tuesday this week. And so the proposal is for next year's budget for the 23-24 fiscal year. This is the beginning of only many, many months of negotiations back and forth between the legislature and the governor until the final budget act is approved sometime between mid and late June. Um, but the January proposal does at least give us an idea of what the governor's priorities are. Um, he will also release the May revise that will give us a better idea of where negotiations between the governor and legislature are sitting. And at that time, there will be much more precise budget figures than we have today. Um, we'll be attending some workshops next week to get more details, but tonight I just want to share a few of the highlights from his proposal. So as we all know, the economy is slowing down and the state no longer has large surpluses that schools have benefited from in the last several years. And in fact, the governor's budget proposal reflects that the state is facing a $22.5 billion budget gap for the 23-24 year. Um, however, California is much, much better prepared to weather some difficult budget years because savings and investments have been made during the past several good years of the budget. So that's that's a very good thing as we head into um, potentially difficult year. And so the governor has been able to address this budget deficit with pretty little impact to schools. So that's very good news. So notably different from recent years, there are only a handful of new initiatives um, in the budget due to projected slowdown the, in the economy and um, lower revenues that the state's bringing in. For LCFF funding, the governor's office is projecting the cost of living adjustment, COLA, to be 8.13%, and the governor is proposing to fully fund that COLA next year. And as Dr. Johnson mentioned, the um, another one of the um, very few new proposals is the governor is proposing a new add-on to LCFF that they're calling an equity multiplier. So schools that qualify for this, it would be in addition to that third layer of the cake. In addition, they still get the concentration grant funding. This will be an add-on on top of that if schools qualify. 
And um, again, this is determined at the individual school site level if 90, for at elementary and middle schools, if 90% or more students are eligible for free meals, they would qualify. And at the high school level, it has to be 85%. Um, so as currently proposed, none of our schools would qualify. However, it's good news that they're at least starting to acknowledge that there are needy individual schools within districts that may not have those exact um, demographics. So we'll continue to advocate so that perhaps we can receive some of those funds as well. Um, the governor is proposing um, a reduction to the one-time arts, remember the arts, music, instructional materials, discretionary block grant that we just added to our budget last month. Um, so in order to uh, afford um, the LCFF fully funded COLA for next year, the governor is proposing to reduce that block grant um, on us. And there he's reduced the original amount of the block grant was three and a half million. He's going to reduce it by 1.2 million billion, sorry, um, which is a reduction of over 34%. So that creates a bit of a challenge for us because that's the one that requires a board approved plan. So we're going to have to create a plan with an amount of money that we don't know how much we're receiving. So that'll be fun. Um, the governor's um, focus seems to be on maintaining programs instead of creating new ones, which we absolutely appreciate. Um, it's um, also important to note that the governor assumes a slow but a still growing economy. He is not. He does not assume a recession um, in his all of his projections. And he's able to present a balanced budget without tapping into any of those reserves that the state's built up. So he's likely holding back that option to tap into reserves until the May revise if the economy worsens um, by that point in time, or if tax revenues come in lower than projected in April. So again, we're going to be learning more about the budget proposal over the coming weeks, and we will analyze the impacts that it has to our, our district. <laughs> I have a question about the uh, this the new equity mm -hmm. increases, and I think I heard you say that they're going to be it's still tied to free and reduced lunch. Correct. How are be, because once the state started making that just a standard thing where you don't need to really qualify, I was concerned that we would see a dip in people actually filling that out and and offering up that information because they don't need that now in order to qualify for the free lunch. Are we seeing that or is there any sort of conversation about the fact that when the state does that, that people don't need to fill that out anymore? And so how are we going to really know what that number is? Yeah, it's absolutely a challenge and we have to really promote and push and get those applications out. So um, I can share, I just had this conversation today with our CNS director. Um, she said that she did um, receive fewer applications than they normally do. However, the amount of directly certified students that we see. So those are students that come on a list from the state because they're on specific oh, okay. state they're on another program. food programs. That number has increased such that the two balance each other out and we got just about the exact same number of students. So, you know, I'd say we got, got lucky in that scenario. You know, I, I am concerned about that too, right? They're making it difficult for us to collect the data we need to qualify for some of the spending. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's, if anybody at the state level is like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> like that probably shouldn't be the, the metric that we're using right. to qualify because it's, it's, yeah. Okay. Our, our numbers haven't dipped too much. That is a very valid concern. We talk about it all the time, but they haven't dipped too much, right? It's been fairly steady. Very steady. I would just also say there's a bigger conversation here about just the whole funding formula in general. I would probably don't want to get into it at the moment, but the L LCFF came in when 13, 14. When was it? When was when the LCFF? 2013. Right? 13, 14. right? Different governor, mostly different legislators. And it, when when LCFF first was put in place, they eliminated 40, 50 categorical, something like that, dumped it all into the bucket, pushed it all out to school sites. It was all about local control. Over the past, what is this now, 10 years, those categoricals have come slowly come back and come back and come back. And the legislators that are in there now weren't there when the whole, it's just a very interesting, you know, the, hist, the, hist, the history isn't quite there. So it's concerning the way it's kind of slowly creeping back. I will say another piece of advocacy that I'll, I'll talk to our folks who, who, who advise us on this 
is, um, you know, maybe the answer is doing away with that third layer, doing away with concentration altogether and dumping it into the, the supplemental grant because that, that one's counted by kids, right? If every, if, if you could figure, if the state could figure out a way where there wouldn't be massive losers like your LA Unifieds, for example, and you dumped it all into the, the uh, supplemental grant, that would be, that would, to me, I think, level the playing field a lot more, but that's just me. Um, so you mentioned that there was a 34% decrease in the arts discretionary spending block. Is it, a, are you able to kind of tell what those direct impacts are going to look like for school sites? Or is that not really a possibility until you find out exactly how much that's going to decrease our budget? Yeah, so we don't know exactly how much it's going to be yet. And this is a brand, this is a brand new program, right? So we were supposed to do new and additional um, efforts in the arts and music. So um, we were still working on planning that. We weren't planning to start any of that until next school year. So no, I don't know what, what the exact impacts are. Okay, I see. Thank you. But, it, but nothing... Nothing that's currently happening in arts and music at our schools that it wouldn't impact that certainly. Oh, okay. That, gotcha. All of that will continue. Okay, great. Nine point zero reports by board members. Does anyone have anything they'd like to report? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Joel. <laughs> Good evening, President Chamberlain and members of the board. Uh, today is workday number eight for me, uh, and I've enjoyed each of them for, for different reasons. Uh, first, I wanna say I really appreciate the support from Dr. Johnson and my cabinet colleagues in my transition into the district. It's been really appreciated. Uh, this week, I've been meeting individually with uh, each of our HR team members to learn more about them and uh, the processes that, that we have in place uh, and ways to continue supporting our work moving forward. Uh, today, we had a staff meeting and engaged in team building exercises, and the feedback that I got from them is that they were really, uh, they really appreciated it, and they were excited to, to work on some team building uh, work together. Um, I'll share with you that I'm extremely impressed uh, by our department and uh, the dedication and the commitment they have to um, supporting our school sites. Uh, today, Dr. DeBoer and I met with CSEA and SMEA leadership representatives, um, and um, I appreciate the common interest that we all have in serving our students. Certainly we have work to do, but that's a great place to start from as we engage in that work together. And finally, I've had the pleasure of visiting a few of our school sites, uh, Twin Oaks High School, Mission Hills High School, uh, San Alejo Middle School, and a scheduled visit to San Marcos High School tomorrow uh, with the goal of getting out to all of our school sites in the, in the coming weeks. Um, and really uh, with an opportunity to, to share um, our commitment from our, our human resources department uh, to support them and do our part in providing an excellent education for, um, for our students and supporting our staff. Um, I wanna close by saying that I'm just I'm so happy and I'm, I'm proud to be part of the San Marcos Unified School District team. And um, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, 9.0. Reports by board members. Does anyone have anything they'd like to report? Well, um, Dr. Johnson already talked about Richland, but I have to say that um, because I drive past that site every day and so I stop off probably way more than they appreciate, but it's been really fun to see the progression of you know the building. And um, I was there while they were setting up, getting ready. And I was really worried that they, I was like, oh my gosh, there's just no way that this is gonna be ready. And they're like, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. Um, and so then I was there on Monday and it was like the first day of school, there was just this buzz and this excitement and it was so much fun. And, um, I'm just thrilled for the community, thrilled for the staff. And it, they worked so hard. I mean, they were seriously there every single day, all through the weekend. It was rainy, it was cold. Um, and cause there's no carpeting in there. And so, and everything's just empty. And so it was kind of, it was cold and it didn't, it didn't feel like school yet until the kids got there. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, yeah, now it feels like it's an elementary school and it's nice and warm and great. Um, but, uh, I just am so excited that that school is up and running and, um, I got to talk to Toba. I ran into Toba on Monday. And so she was giving me the rundown of, um, you know, when, what the, what the timeline was and getting the rest of the, the school done in the fields and how it was going to look from, you know, from the street side and everything. And so i um, very excited uh, for the project to be completed uh, at the end of the school year. 
That's a, yeah, I like to echo. I'm very excited about Richland. I, I can't wait to go visit the new site now that it's kind of completed. Almost, you know, phase one is completed. Um, I do want to wish everyone a very happy new year. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. Um, I do want to say I'm incredibly excited as our cabinet and our district is kind of getting more stabilized, you know. So for me, coming in at the time of COVID was, you know, we were in like <clears throat> chaos up to our years and COVID didn't help. So seeing the addition of, you know, Joel and, you know, all everyone that has come on board. And I, I really feel that, you know, our district is shaping up to be one awesome team. And I'm just so excited for the future. So I think we're here till 1030 in December. And it was, but yeah, it was like, I had the opportunity to attend a DLAC meeting last month, and I was so impressed with parent leadership and uh, just really the updates of all the sites and what they were doing. And, and it's exciting to see our DLAC parents here tonight as well. Um, usually Patricia is here alone. So thank you to our DLAC leaders for being here. Uh, I loved, loved our site visit to uh, Twin Oaks, and I was just so impressed with the work. I know I said it earlier, and I'm excited to have the board, you know, visit again and, and, the, and the support that we'll be able to provide and leadership that the district's providing and growing that program to a, an award-winning program that people from all over the nation will come visit and see what we're doing here in San Marcos. So I'm excited about where it's going. So thank you so much for uh, your leadership, Tiffany. And welcome, Andres and Joel. Thank you for com helping complete us here. Yeah, I just wanted to say Happy New Year to everybody, and um, I'm so excited about 2023. Thank you. Just to kind of add on to Richland, I, I'm a proud product of being at Richland Elementary for two years, fifth and sixth grade, so I'm I'm happy to see this. So thank you to the former or to all the board members who made that happen as well, and the community. Okay, 10.0, action, action agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021-2022 annual audit? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so tonight, um, before we get to approving the audit, um, we have our partner, John Whitehouse, from our um, independent um, audit firm, Christy White. He's going to just share with you some of the the highlights and the, some of the findings um, of the audit. So with that, I'll let John take over. Good evening, Governing Board. Thank you for having me here. Um, we've concluded our audit of the district's funds, capital assets, long-term debt, and compliance with federal and state law for the year ended June 30, 2022. Um, I just wanted to cover kind of uh, some of the information in our opinion letters. It first talks about the uh, responsibilities of management uh, for the financial statements. Management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America and for the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls relevant to the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements and that they are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error. Um, our auditor's objectives um, is to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements as a whole are free of material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error, and to issue an independent auditor's report that includes our opinions. In our opinion, the financial statements for uh, referred um, to as in the financial or in the reports that you have in front of you, uh, present fairly in all material respects, the respective financial position of the governmental activities, the business type activities, each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information of San Marcos Unified School District as of June 30, 2022. Um, that is the opinion that we've re, uh, provided for the district. Uh, that is a clean opinion. It's an unmodified opinion. It's the best opinion that a district can receive from an external audit firm. The results of our audit tests are reflected in the independent auditor's reports and summary of auditor's results. We opined on the financial statements, the report on state compliance, and the report on federal compliance, all which were given unmodified opinions for the year ended June 30, 2022. 
However, overall, there were three findings and question costs uh, related to state awards for this year. And we'll go through uh, those um, briefly. And those start on page 92 of the report. <clears throat> so the first finding was in relation to instructional materials. Um, per Ca California Education Code, um, <clears throat> the governing uh, it requires the governing board of each local education agency or LEA to hold a public hearing um, and make a determination through a resolution on whether each pupil has sufficient textbooks and instructional materials on or before the end of the eighth week from the first day of the school year. Um, and during our testing, um, we noticed that uh, that hearing pl uh, took place nine weeks, so it wasn't within the time frame that was required per education code. So it's a very minor finding, but it's um, you know one that's required um, per the state audit guide. And that cause was you know administrative oversight, and there are no question costs related to that one. <clears throat> the second finding has to do with the unduplicated pupil count. Um, and during our testing, two out of 25 students um, from the CalPads 1.18 um, report <clears throat> um, who were classified as English learners under the ELAS de designation and paid under the NSLP designation were inaccurately classified um, as of the 2021-22 census date. Um, <clears throat> and so this error rate was extrapolated to the entire population. And the question cost associated with this is $43,555, or $554, which will be need to be returned to the state. Um, and that essentially will be adjusted in next year's um, LCFF um, apportionment. The last finding relates to attendance reporting, and this is related to independent study. And so during our testing of uh, average daily attendance um, at Foothills High School um, in relation to independent study, um, <clears throat> when testing uh, the second period report and the annual report, it was noted that all of the ADA for independent study was uh, allotted to the ninth through 12th graders um, when it should have been allocated uh, from TK through 12th grade. Um, so each of those buckets of um, grade spans, you know, nine through 12th, seven through eighth, um, four through six, and TK through third, they all are allotted a different base ADA rate. Um, so it was all allocated to high school when it needs to be on those other buckets as well. And so <clears throat> the question costs associated with that is going to be $135,324. Um, and again, it'll be adjusted with through the LCFF. And that was the last finding. Any questions about anything presented for the report? Question about the unduplicated funding, you know, uh, unduplicated number. So we had calculated more than they were and doesn't that just go back to what we you know you just asked like how are we determining oh, is it English learners? is the English learner sorry I read on duplicated okay got it yes correct we had um, classified two students as English learners that we should not have right so we were mm -hmm. uh, qualifying for more funds so without those two yeah. students we had to return those funds to the state yeah, in each of those situations, um, the apparent consultation occurred in early September of 2021, which resulted in the determination that each of those students should have been reclassified as uh, RFVP or redesignated fluent English profic proficient. So they found, so we misclassified uh, them. We're going to, you know, return the funds that we had. What is, uh, what kind of steps are we taking to, to prevent that misclassification to happen again? So this was a clerical error. Okay. They had reclassified in September and it was not updated in Synergy correctly. Got it. So we have corrected that process. 
execute. So usually the reclassification happens in the spring. And so it, now hearing what you just shared, it was probably, it, it wasn't entered correctly into CalPATS correctly with the reclassification of those two students. Yes. It is not September, the transfer of the information. Yes. I was just I was just letting you know when that when that consultation of the parents occurred was in September, but the information just didn't get moved over properly. I have a question about the foothills. Um, is that because foothills originally started out as a high school, and so we didn't have some a system to yes, do that? That's absolutely correct. We have okay. spread, we have spreadsheets built <laughs> that um, worked for the old program right. um, before the pandemic. And we just didn't catch it. And so when my staff pulls all the attendance data in and they dump it in the spreadsheet, they have it coded to grades nine, nine through 12. And so we have now fully updated our worksheets related to attendance reporting and um, won't make that mistake anymore, but. Okay, thanks. And it just so happens that the ninth through 12th was the highest. The highest base, funded. Yeah, the high, grade highest level, funding right. uh, for ADA. So we had to reduce it. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I have one more question, sorry, about this eight week, nine week thing. So does it have to be at least eight weeks? Or Cause I'm assuming it was because we have board meetings scheduled at certain times yes. and so. And, yeah, and I can share with you mm -hmm. that that will be a finding next year as well because John and I did not have a phone call about the um, audit until the week after we held that public hearing this year. And I'm like, dang it. Okay. Um, so um, we've got it now. We're going to move that public hearing to September every year, um, but I, I'll, it will be a finding next year as well because mm -hmm. we missed it by just a few days that, okay. this year as well. Yes. Got it. No, no question costs associated. So. Yeah, I know, but we're perfectionists yes. up here. So, Absolutely. okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021-2022 aud annual audit? I'll move to approve. Second. Moved by Stacy, seconded by Sarah to approve the annual audit as presented. Student board representative, please say your vote. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.2, Memorandum of Understanding with the San Marcos Educators Association, class coverage. Joel? Yes, board members, like most districts in the county, if not all districts in the county, we've faced challenges with having enough substitute, enough substitute teachers to provide class coverage. We appreciate our certificated staff being willing to take on the responsibility of class coverage when a substitute teacher is not available. The attached Memorandum of Understanding indicates agreement between uh, CS, I'm sorry, between SMEA and uh, the district to compensate secondary teachers when they voluntarily cover a vacant classroom assignment. Included in, in uh, with this item are the disclosure documents, which certify that the cost of this agreement can be met through the term of the agreement. Uh, board members, this is an action item uh, is being presented for your review and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So this came up when we really had a surge over a year ago, I think it was a year ago, and we have, have families that have planned their leave. So teachers have you know, decided to expand their family and take time off and, and they were hit. And it, was, it wasn't a lot of teachers, but it was, it was enough that we were getting lots of emails. So it, is that going to impact them? Because if let's say I decide to extend my leave by X amount of dates, I have to pay the sub rate. And I've already pre-planned that and deciding how many extra days or weeks I'm going to take off. And I don't know how many families this was impacting, but it was enough for us to bring it to the attention of the board and, and also to HR. So. Sure. And, and Dr. Yo, I think um, that relates to an item that we'll be uh, discussing, a national item that we'll be discussing in, in a bit, right? It is related, though, because of the sub coverage piece. Um, with this particular MOU, if, if we do not have a, we don't have a substitute teacher that's identified, then uh, at the secondary level, 
Um, we have our certificated staff that are again volunteering during their prep period to cover those those vacant classrooms. Um, and so, um, you know, we have language included on there for uh, special education teachers and non classroom based assignments in order to compensate them for for that additional work that they're that they're doing, um, in addition to their daily rate. It's a different issue than the one you're thinking. Yeah. So this is when a teacher is out and we're going to have another teacher cover them. Correct. There's a, when there's a shortage. Because of the shortage of subs. Right. Mm -hmm. We did this with elementary teachers last year. Yeah. Sure. So. Okay. Okay. I, 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 the, the next thing you're going to present is what I've already talked about. That's coming down the, down the agenda, yes. Coming to traction. Do I have a motion to approve the MOU with SMEA class I, coverage? I motion to approve. Second. I'll second. Moved by Carla, second by Stacy, to approve the MOU as presented. Student board representative, please say your vote. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.3, resolution 17-22-23. Resolution of the governing board of the San Marcos Unified School District, acting as a legislative body of the community facility number 15 to establish fund 4915, a capital project fund for the for blended component units. Aaron? Okay. Oh, so the awesome. board the board has previously met last school year acting as a legislative body for community facility districts number 15 and 16 to properly establish and form those CFDs. So the next two items on the agenda tonight, 10.3 and 10.4, are simply resolutions to establish an individual separate fund at the county treasury in order to deposit any funds received from these two CFDs. These resolutions are required by the San Diego County Office of Education and the county treasurer before opening any new fund account. And because CFDs are generated from a special tax levy, they must be accounted for separately from any other fund operated by the district in its own individual fund. So I recommend approval of both of these resolutions in order to establish a new CFD fund accounts. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution 17 2223? Move to approve. I'll second. Moved by Member Stacy, second by Carlos to adopt resolution 17 2323 as presented. Student Board Representative, please say your vote. Aye. Members of the Board? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.4 resolution 18-2223 resolution of the governing board of the San Marcos Unified School District acting as a legislative body of the community facility number 16 to establish fund 4916 a capital project fund for blended component units Aaron same thing same action except for CFD number 16 do I have a motion to adopt resolution 18-2223 okay I move to approve I'll second. Moved by Sarah, second by Andreas to adopt resolution 18 2323 as presented. Student board representative, please say your vote. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.5. <clears throat> Cert certificated and classified personnel changes, including hiring, resignation, leave of absence, promotions, retirement reassignments and independent contractor. Joel? Yes, and included in tonight's personnel agenda is a recommendation to approve the employment of Mr. Ted Norman as the Executive Director of Maintenance and Operations. Mr. Norman comes uh, to us with over 25 years of experience in school facility management. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from University of California, Irvine, and a maintenance management certificate from the California Coalition for Adequate School Housing. Previously, uh, Ted worked as a director of maintenance and operations uh, for the Capistrano Unified School District, leading a department with an annual budget of $39 million, 250 full-time employees, and serving over 50,000 students at 63 facilities. Currently, uh, Ted is serving as the director of maintenance and operations with the San Diego Union High School District. 
uh, board members, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, Mr. Ted Norman. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me here tonight. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited about joining this team and, and supporting uh, student achievement throughout the district. Um, you know, my focus is on uh, uh, preserving uh, and improving the learning environments for all students. And I'm really excited about uh, jumping in and getting started on that work on February 1st. So thank you again and appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, 10.5. Do I have a motion to approve certificated and classified personnel actions? I move to approve. Second. Moved by Stacy, seconded by Andreas to approve the personal actions as presented. Student board representative, please say your vote. Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 11.0, consent. Yes, welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> Drive safe. 11.0, consent agenda. Are there any items that need to be pulled? Okay, so this is my first time doing this, so rookie mistake. 11.1, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to hold this up, so how, how do 11.11, 11, right? Um, I And I already spoke to this, and I just want to make sure that any person that is on leave for, for family planning to expand their family, that they're not deemed, because a year ago they were deemed, and it was quite substantial the amount. And I just want to make sure that if we have anyone on family leave, whether it's mother or father, that they are not deemed because I just, they should not be impacted by this. I'm all for coverage. I'm all for raising the rate I, because I don't want anyone pulled, whether it's the principal or, you know, someone who's it's during their prep period. So I'm all for raising the rate. You, you have my support on that, but I don't want anyone income in impaired, impacted, or negatively, you know, that they're going to have to fund it. So just a question, can we just get again for the people listening and watching what 11.11 11 is? Can I just point of order? Like, um, yeah. so. So what we, what we, yeah, what we need to do is we need to pull 11.11, 11, vote on the consent agenda and come back to 11.11. Uh, 11 okay. And vote on it. okay. That's what I thought, but I just. So I'll, I will I'll move disagree. to approve the consent agenda with uh 11.11 11 pulled correct and i will second that move move by stacy seconded by sarah to approve the consent agenda for discussion purposes exception of with the exception of 11.11 11. is there any discussion no y yes no, so, no, consent not on 11.11 11. <laughs> No, 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 okay. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Consent agenda. I motion to approve. And I'll second it. Moved by Carlos, seconded by Sarah. Student board representative, please say your vote. Aye. Board members in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Let's go back to 11.11. .11. So day nine, I, I really don't want this to impact any parents that are on leave, any of our staff certificated, classified out on family leave for whatever reason. I just feel like, yes, I want our subs to be paid more to attract, especially for those Fridays, to attract people to want to sub for us so no one is negatively impacted whether you're on leave financially or if you are pulled to sub right volunteer voluntold i just feel like this is i i we need i don't even know that it's even impacting any teachers i don't even know if we have one but i just know that last year we did how did we handle this last time um, so uh, I'll share that. First of all, this item is to approve a, a revised salary schedule for non-bargaining unit positions. So there, um, the we've updated this schedule to 
uh, comply with minimum wage that increased to $15 and 50 cents this January for um, a few of the positions that are on there. Um, but this schedule also includes uh, the rates for substitute teachers. And so we were including a, re a revised uh, uh, rate for substitute teachers of $250 that would, we're um, naming as a high impact day um, that would be paid every Friday because over the fall, we were having significant um, challenges covering um, substitute coverage on Fridays where we had our you know, teachers covering multiple classes of students, particularly on Friday. So we have an MOU in place now to um, compensate them, but we do want to make sure it's reasonable that our, our teachers aren't having to cover so many classes for, for safety reasons and all of that. So I'm assuming that we discussed the specifically the increase in sub pay with our bargaining units and that I we haven't heard any sort of concerns from them about the increase in sub pay. We heard about it after we had voted on it. That's what I so I don't know the that was two times ago. We we've we did this when was the last time we did this last spring? Um I believe we were the last time we increased the substitute rate was at the start of this school year, right? Permanently. And we did have that discussion um, with SMEA and uh, we determined and we notified everyone that was, you know, currently um, on on a leave um, that those rates were increasing um, and that there if so what happens is when anytime a teacher is on leave and they've exhausted. Um, all of their long-term leave, they've exhausted all of their leaves, and then they are paid the difference. It's called differential pay between their um, pay and the cost of that substitute teacher. So you're saying so when we do, when we increase the sub rates at the beginning of this school year in August, um, we are currently docking um, teachers on leave for the, that. If they existing, extend their leave. If it's existing. For family leave. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what you, what you mean by extend their leave, well, but once, if they're on it, if they're on a long-term leave of some kind and they run out of sick leave. They've exhausted, they've their, they've own exhausted their own sick leave balance. Sick leave during that right. period of so, time. Like, so if you exhaust your sick leave, you are having to pay for that sub because you have a contract. No, I wouldn't say that you have to pay for the sub. The district's paying for the sub, but your pay is docked for the difference of the, the cost. So of that you would sub. be docked whatever we increase it to. Yeah. That number, that amount would go up. Explain. Can you explain how differential pay works? Sure. So once once the sick leave is exhausted, um, then. Um, Certificated staff are entitled to 100 days of differential pay during that remaining leave time, right, for up to 100 days. And so that differential piece is what we look at is uh, looking at each uh, each teacher certificated staff's uh, daily rate and then subtracting from that the substitute teacher coverage. That's what I just said. So what's the per diem for a teacher? So the per diem for teachers is it's right. It's different for everyone depending on where they are and the where they are. Right. But for the substitute pay for teacher, it's 185 is, days, correct? But the pay for the sub um, on a Friday is going to be $250. That will be their per diem. Correct. That's good. That would be increased to 250 Okay. On a Friday. But Friday for, the, Friday for our average teacher, if we look at like where most of our teachers are falling in, or our teachers who, are, who would be out on parental leave, what would their per diem be? On average. So it, it is different. I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's a wide range, really. Looking at the salary schedule. Definitely, they will be every single teacher will so be receiving something. And just you know, keep in mind over the course, we're ta only talking about increasing the rate on Fridays, right? Mm -hmm. So over the course of one one month, so it's a fifty an additional fifty dollars just on Fridays. So there's four Fridays in a month. So that would be two hundred dollars. Um, less that they would receive How much in a particular teacher make because you, it's really going to impact those because those are the ones who are planning their family right mm -hmm. potentially so what does a beginning teacher make what is their per diem i can't i can't tell you off the top of my head i'd have to do a calculation 
no, but I, un I understand your concern. You're, I think yeah. the, the concern, if I'm understanding you correctly, is um, if, if you're already on different. Like a lot, but for a beginning teacher, that's a lot of money. Sure. And and I don't know if we're just talking hypothetically. I don't even know if we have anyone on family this type of leave, right? That is would impact them. You're telling me the difference between what they normally pay and what you pay, right? Correct. So it's only a fifty dollar difference. For, for, $50 for more, Friday only. more for the separate, but then Correct. I guess Carlos's question is, you know, what if for a starter starting teacher, if they're making 200, you know, a day, just for example, or 300, then you're subtracting 250 from that on a Friday, right? So where's, where's a new teacher's per diem? Leaving so, them? okay. So if I'm doing fast math and I'm saying our our in, our inter teacher our beginning teachers are at about fifty thousand dollars a year ish, right? And we divide that by the number of contract days is like what one hundred eighty five or something. Yeah, that's how you calculate I, your per I just want to I want us to be careful. It'll be two seventy. I don't know. Perhaps perhaps the board I don't know, table this item and we can bring back yeah. more details yeah. next time. You know, I don't. I would hate to. Do that. Very, very few of our teachers are paid at the bottom of the salary schedule. Usually, they come in with significant um, education, and they they're paid more. So, I, I you know what sure we've made it this far. I would like for us to table it and find out if it's going to impact anyone, and if it's not, then we move forward. It will. So, it, I, I mean, it's likely going to impact somebody. So, we'll get you yeah. the, the information. We'll take. I, I would recommend the board table this item. We'll bring you more information. It will impact somebody, and it, there there are trade offs here. So, um, while we while our sub our our fill rates on Fridays are are the ones that are struggling right now. Yeah. And there are teachers who are currently paid teachers who are bearing the brunt of that. So we're trying to find a way to fulfill it. So we'll get you the information right. and we'll bring it I back. I just feel that our teachers give their heart and soul for 185 days. They plan a family, whether you know they're young or older or a brand new teacher or late in their profession, but $200 is $200. It may not seem a lot to those who are up here, but to a teacher it is. And I, for me, it's like they give their heart and soul for 185 days. Their mind doesn't turn off thinking about their kids. They're thinking about their kids when they're at home bonding with their newborn. So that doesn't turn off. But I just, for me, if they planned ahead to expand their family, grow their family, and now we're saying, oh, you know what, COVID, we have a sub shortage. We're going to, sorry. this. Is, so I just want to know if this is impacting. And I know it's, it seems like we're spending a lot of time on this, but it's impacting someone or maybe it's not. Well, I feel like, uh, Carlos, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel, or if I'm misstating you, I feel the issue isn't the idea that it would be subtracted from their pay because I believe that's something that teachers all understand. But I think it's if someone is already on leave and if someone has already planned that they will be deducted a certain amount to now raise that amount of deduction on them seems unfair. It's like the ones that may not already be on leave, you know. In the middle of their leave. They the had planned for a certain raise. Yes, and if I'm understanding leave, you correctly. They've, they've already planned for it, right? So okay. having them be impacted is unfair versus someone that hasn't planned for it yet. You know, so is, I, I don't think the issue is the actual deduction. It's when it's hitting them. Right. So, okay, so can we, I, I, so my concern is, is that if we wait another month that everybody who was about to get a raise tonight is going to have to wait a month because we want to talk about sub pay. So can we approve this with the exception of, of increasing the sub pay so that everybody else is covered and then we'll come back and talk about sub pay later? Yes, we can do that. Okay. okay, so I will move to approve that with the the uh, eleven point eleven with the exception of sub pay. Okay, I, I second I second that. And I have a motion to approve eleven dot dot eleven as amended. Move to approve, and I'll second. Moved by Stacy, second by Sarah. <clears throat> Student board representative, please say your vote. Board members in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 12.0, information agenda. 12.1, purpose uh, proposed new high school courses. Dr. Campbell? Hi again. 
I am bringing forth, Ed Services is bringing forth three new proposed courses um, for your consideration tonight. The first is an engineering and design development course. Um, it is part of a pathway. It's part of a Project Lead the Way pathway for our um, career technical education um, program. Students are required to have already gone through a portion of the pathway, Intro to Engineering and Design or Principle of Engineering. Um, the course will meet a science requirement. It will meet a third year of science requirement for A through G. Um, and it is a caps capstone course. Super excited about this class because it really is about students working together in teams, collaborating on open-ended projects. So when we think about future ready and the types of skills that we want our students to have, this course is a prime example of that. Second course is financial algebra. It is a math course, nine through 12 can take it, no prerequisite because it is an algebra course. However, um, it differs in that it is looking at practical aspects of algebra. Um, so while students will learn all of the standards that are related to algebra, it really is going to be through the lens of making sense of the financial world around them. And um, so, as you know, we already have a financial literacy class. This is another way that we can offer kids um, some real world experience, if you will, connected to a standards course, a graduation requirement that they have to take. And the last course um, I mentioned previously um, is our translation and interpretation one. This is also part of our college uh, uh, CTE program. Um, it is a um, first course of a two-year path, a two-year course pathway that we will take that we are having our kids do. So kids will have to have gone through Spanish to Spanish Speakers 2 or Spanish 3 Honors because this is a high level um, translation course. So it is in a collaboration and partnership with Cal State San Marcos. Um, students will take course one, which gives the introduction. Course two um, will be the completion of the course. And at the end, they will receive a certificate from Cal State San Marcos that they can use for employment. Any questions for any of those courses? I don't have any questions for any of these courses, but the engineering and design course uh, reminded me of something that from my, my day job. Um, there is, uh, the federal government just recently passed the CHIP Act and, and they are infusing the economy and whatnot to build out the semiconductor industry in the United States. A big portion of that bill is towards educating the future workers and semiconductor engineers of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and it comes with a ton of funding. Um, so it would be great to see if we at the high school level, because I know a lot, I mean, the colleges are all over this, yeah. right? But it would be great to see if we could somehow tap into mm -hmm. those funds and offer engineering courses or design that's geared toward the semiconductors. And for those of you who don't know, semiconductors are little chips that drive everything. So if you're drive, if you have a smartwatch, if you are, I mean, you name it, it's in it. And it might even be in your clothing. So, you know, <laughs> so they are the wave of the future, if you will. They are driving the wave of the future. So it would be great to look into that. Definitely look into it. Yeah. I will make a note. Just as a comment about the EDD course and capstone classes, courses that we have and we're offering, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. A lot of the universities are, they 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 love it when kids do these capstone courses. San Diego State University, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, my district, we send many of our students to those universities. And because of the EDD class, it gives them a cutting edge when applying to the university. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, I have a few questions. First off, I'm a little jealous that I won't be able to take any of these courses. <laughs> um, could you first go into the definition of what a capstone course is? Yes. So it is the final course. It's considered the final course in a pathway of a CTE for CTE. So typically it's two or three courses that students take, and they will likely get some sort of certificate at the end of it. Okay, gotcha. And then um, the finance algebra class. 
Um, so I know that a common conversation that's been happening on at least on my campus is sort of a disconnect between different teachers teaching different courses and then you go from one teacher to the next in your next course and it can be kind of difficult to make that transition. Um, is the finance algebra class going to be a difficult transition to either algebra two or to calculus whatever the students take like how is that going to look? It should not be because it is fundamentally an algebra class. Okay. So the standards will be the same. The teachers are still in the, they are still doing their PLCs all together, but it is just a slightly different focus. It's the lens of how the class is presented. I see. So it's the application that looks a little bit different. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. And then my final question, um, the translation course, um, I think about college requisites and a through G looks different than certain colleges requirements for their admissions. Will the translation course fulfill those language requirements for colleges as well? Yes, it is considered a level four course. Okay. Yes, which is why you have the prerequisites of the Spanish for Spanish speakers two or um, the three honors. Gotcha. Okay. Three, three honors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To follow up on Abigail's question, what is the um, prerequisite for financial algebra? Is there a grade level specific or can a ninth grader hop into that class? Ninth grader can take okay. it any grade level because it is an algebra course. So I imagine likely that most in it will be ninth graders, actually. Thank you, These Dr. courses Kappa. will come back to you next month for approval. Thank you. 13.0, closing items. 13.1, organizational matters. The next regular board meeting will take place on Thursday, February 9th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the Media Center of the North County Regional Education Center, 255 Pico Avenue, San Marcos, California, 92069. 13.2, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.